So. Uh oh. Hello. Are we here? Can you hear me? Can you see me? <laughs> Maybe I'm attending Tiny Meat Computer. No, um, uh, Fancier Meat Computer is attending Tiny Meat Computer this morning. Um, I forgot to start the stream, yeah. How long have I been going? About four minutes I've been going, not realizing that I wasn't actually streaming anything. Ha! Well, there we go. Well, that's just the kind of morning it's going to be, I guess. <laughs> okay. Oh my gosh. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Um, you know, it's kind of funny. Like, I... Just because of the way that internet culture is, when I saw, like, the first message or two about the fact that the stream wasn't actually streaming, I thought that it might be trolling, because that's a, that's a trick that trolls actually use to try to interrupt your stream, is to claim that the stream isn't coming through when it is. But, uh, yeah, anyway... Anyway, good morning, good morning, meat computers. Good morning, fancy meat computers. Um, yep. Yeah. Hello, 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 hello. Um, sorry about that, I guess. That's, that's the time I usually use for announcements anyways. So, you didn't miss much, is what I'm going to say. You didn't miss much. Uh, we don't actually have any announcements. I was just kind of making chit-chat, it turns out, completely to myself, and, uh, yep. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. So, <clears throat> so, getting right back into Python. Let's talk tuples. We were just about finished with tuples last time. So, if you create a tuple, you can assign a tuple to a variable, just like you would assign anything else to a variable. Imagine we have a, uh, a tuple, like so. So, you access the elements of a tuple using square braces. Note that the first element is zero. So this is called zero indexing. Every single programming language that you are likely to use uh, will use zero indexing for these guys. It has to do with complicated stuff related to pointers. And... Um, <laughs> Uh, for, for more information, for a follow-up on why this is, uh, please take 1xc3 next semester. Um, so, if you want to concatenate, that's plus. If you want to uh, check the size, or get, return the size of a, uh, a tuple, or pretty much any data structure, it turns out, use len, that is length, and you also have a built-in search operator. 5 in t... True. Seven in T. False. There you go. There we go. So, here are some interesting observations about tuples. A couple of people last time were asking me what the difference is between a tuple and a list, and the main difference is mutability. We're not going to get into mutability and immutability really until we get into um, topic four, but uh, this is a quick intro. The basic, like the most basic property of mutability that's likely to interfere with your day is the fact that if you have an immutable data structure, you can't actually assign to the elements of it. So if I had t at four and I wanted to give it the term apple, I am prevented from doing so. Tuple object does not support item assignment. If, however, I had a list, which is very similar to a tuple, just uses square braces instead of round braces. There we go. And I said L at 4 is equal to apple. Not only does the operation not fail, it also does what you think it would. So there you go. Um, so that's one of the main differences between a tuple and a list, is you can't assign to a tuple after it's been created. 
Um, is there a reason why tuple is not mutable? Uh, well, because you would want one that was and one that wasn't. Um, I don't know. You should ask the people who designed Python. Um, one XC3, I have no prof at the moment for that course. Yeah, so I'm a sessional professor, which means that I have to apply for the contract every time the contract comes up. And um, the fact that there's no prof listed for that course yet is actually a very good thing because it means that it will, at this point, most probably go to um, contracts. Uh, it'll go to a sessional contract, and I am highly likely to be able to pick up that sessional contract because I've taught the course before, and the department likes to have people teach the courses uh, consecutively because if they're doing well with them because... Um, like, you get more quality and consistency out of a course if a prof has taught it a few times. Um, what if you modified a list in a tuple? Ha! <laughs> Alright. Alright, Mr. Edgecase. I'm going to call you Mr. Edgecase from now on. So, let's say that's uh, T2. T2 at 1 at 4, oh my goodness, at 4 is equal to potato. Oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm messing up my own zero indexing. There we go. So, if you have a list that's inside of a tuple, apparently that still works. Um... That's, um, <laughs> so I know the reason for that. The reason for that is that when you're storing a list inside of a tuple, you're not actually storing the list itself inside of a tuple. You're storing a reference to that list. The reference itself does not change. You can use the reference to assign different things to the, tu to the list that's inside of the tuple. The tuple itself, like the values in the tuple are not changing the values at the memory address pointed to by the first element of the tuple are changing. That's going to be a complicated explanation that's not going to make sense to most of you. Again, wait till you take 1xc3. Um, so, how do I become permanent? Um, well, you have to apply for it. Um, you have to have extremely good teaching evaluations. Uh, you have to, you know, have demonstrated uh, that you can handle the workload, and you have to have graduated from your uh, PhD program. Um, yeah, good. Why potato with double quotes to potato with single quotes? We're actually going to get to that today, so I'm just going to let the slides do the talking. Yeah, yeah, tuples are basically non-mutable list lists. So, let's talk strings. Right. So, <clears throat> strings. So we talked about tuples. Strings are, technically speaking, another aggregate data type. It is more, way more correct for a, uh, for a string to become, uh, for you to consider a string to be an aggregate data type than to be its own literal. Although Python does a lot of work in the background for you to like possibly think that this could be a literal when it's actually an aggregate data type. Um, so uh, I have a couple of questions. It's like 1XC3 is the second movie in the series. Yeah. <laughs> How do you become tenured? Uh, well, the thing that I would be shooting for is actually a teaching track position rather than a tenure track position because I prefer teaching to research. Um, you still do a little bit of research in teaching track, but it's mostly teaching. Um, to become tenured, you have to um, be hired on as like like, there are various ranks of professorship, right? I believe it's, like, um, associate professor, assistant professor, and then professor. I could be wrong about that. Um, 
it, you get hired into the tenure track and then when like once you have you know been there a sufficiently long time and accumulated a sufficient number of papers and that sort of thing um, you are I believe promoted by a committee of your peers to a higher rank uh, and if the top rank is prof is like tenured professor I believe you're not considered to have tenure unless you are the full professor. I think that's correct. But that's not really the, the route I'm pursuing anyway. Um, what does mutable actually mean? It comes from the word mutate. That is correct. Um, the value can be changed. Immutable, the value cannot be changed. Yes. Are strings mutable? No, strings are not mutable. Um, strings are like tuples. They are not mutable. Um, and yeah, um, the definition of mutable that, uh, that Felix in the chat is, has produced is applicable to computer science as well. Although lists in other languages are usually single typed, tuples become more useful in the sense of getting values from different types. Well, actually in Python, lists are not monotyped either. Uh, <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, no, that that distinction is not a distinction in 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 uh, in in Python. I can have a list that combines multiple different data types. As you can see right here, I've got one two one two potato. Potato is not a number. Uh, potato is not a number. Nick Moore, twenty twenty one. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> so strings then. Strings are lists of characters. They're technic in the in the Python sense, they're actually closer to tuples of characters. Uh, they have a special syntax that um, you don't have to put commas in between the elements of this tuple. Uh, by putting open and close quote, you have that like that's enough. Every character that's in there is uh, you know one element of this thing. Like, for example, if I have a string, s is, um, uh, m-i-s-s-i-s-s-i-p-p-i, -S 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 -I, Mississippi, if I convert that to a tuple, this is what, this is closer to how the computer actually stores a string. Uh, each letter separately as elements of a data structure. Yeah, I meant list in Python can have multiple types, but for example, Haskell doesn't do that. Correct! Um, if you want to change a string, uh, would you have to overwrite it? Yes. So if you want to change the element of it, uh, if you want to change a particular element of a string, say, put a K in there, a type error, string object does not support item assignment. The same error that we get with tuples. So strings are not mutable. They are immutable. They share that property with tuples. You can't assign to them after their creation. The only way to modify them is to destroy them and recreate them with the modification. So, yes. So an interesting thing about uh, strings for all you veteran programmers out there Python does not recognize a difference between character types and strings. Uh, for a for a Python, a character is a singleton string. A singleton just means a thing with one thing in it. So, in other languages, um, and this this will be important for you guys once you hit one XC three and start doing C programming. In C, for example. A single character is delimited by single quotes. A group of characters is delimited by double quotes. So in C, this is a string, and this would be an invalid character because this character has multiple characters in it. This would actually not be an error in C. This would be a warning, but that's just how C is. Um, so in Python, it doesn't matter what, t what uh, quotes you use. Single quotes and double quotes are both um, both perfectly legal 
markers for strings. And um, if you want to get the, uh, if you want to get it like, if you want to get right down technical about it, in general, there's a preference among like real programmers for single quotes as opposed to double quotes in Python because uh, it requires one more keystroke to produce a double quote than it does a single quote because you have to have shift key holded, holded, held. You have to hold shift key to produce a double quote, whereas single quote, that's just a button. So um, in general, you minimize your keystrokes if you use single quotes. But, you know, it's unlikely that you'll be programming fast enough to, uh, to worry about saving keystrokes like that. Even if you're an expert programmer, generally speaking, it's better to, it's better to program carefully than quickly. But, uh, but yeah, so I think I'm going to sneeze. This class is like the, the training arc in a show. Yes, 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 yes. Da da da. Da da da. Oh, is Avenue is uh, assignment two not up on Avenue yet? Uh, let me write that down. I'll I'll take a look. I'll kick Mark's butt. Okay. Kick Mark's. But, there we go. All right. Um, it will be shortly, if it's not right now. I'll check after class. So. So. Um, yeah, so in Python, single quotes, double quotes, both mean the same thing. But this is not transferable to other languages, just be aware. So here's a question. What if you want quotes inside of, a, inside of a string literal? Well, you have two options. Number one, you can insert quotes so long as you're using the other type of quote to delimit the string. So if I said S is, you know, sarcastically, then you can see that that's valid. Whereas, if I tried to put these quotes in there like that, if I tried to put double quotes within the double quotes uh, just like that, I would get a syntax error. This is invalid syntax. Basically, what's going on here is that I have now an empty string, the word sarcastically, which is not valid Python code, and then another empty string at the end of it with no spaces in between. That's how Python would interpret this. However, if I change these to single quotes, it's looking for the ending single quote to end the string with. So um, in that case, this not only type checks, but it also does what we expect it to do. So there you go. The second way of doing this is to use what are called escape characters. If you put a slash anywhere in a string literal, what you've actually done is you've created a character. It's kind of like a compound character. It's a character that takes up two characters on the screen. So these two characters together are a sync, are a, um, a double quote. And it will print out as a double quote, even though like the, the, the backslash disappears. All that is it, all that does, it's, it's a little bit like holding shift, um, it's like a different type of shift. It, it does. It's a It's a. It is a key press, but it doesn't. Uh, it isn't a character in and of itself. Incidentally, if you want to insert a backslash character, uh, you do backslash backslash. There you go. Um, we use an escape character. Um, yes. I guess you got Mark in trouble for no reason. <laughs> okay. Yes, please try to keep... Uh, Lord knows I have enough trouble keeping my classes straight. Um, we all need to make an effort to try to keep our classes straight this semester. Um, so, <clears throat> characters. So let's talk about these characters for a moment. 
What type of letters can we use in our strings? Historically speaking, most languages only allowed what are called ASCII characters. ASCII is a, it's a code that dates from the 1960s and was originally used in teletype machines. So teletype was one of the early variants of electric typewriter. Um, yeah. So, through the history of the development of, like, computing apparati, um, there was a time before, before the existence of keyboards when a computer didn't have a convenient way to interface letters with it. Um, you remember we, uh, in the last set of lecture slides, we talked about punch cards, uh, where you had to actually take a stack of cards, punch holes in them, and that's how you um, that's how you wrote a program. And then you put that punch deck of punch cards into the machine, and the machine would, you know, process the cards one at a time out of your stack. Punch cards. Uh, this was before the development of. Um, this was before many of the modern conveniences we now enjoy, uh, like touch screens. So. Parallel to the development of computers, there was the development of typewriters. Typewriters were uh, actually an extremely useful invention because they allowed um, they allowed people to um, create documents at speeds like that were not like that you simply could not accomplish with just like handwriting. Not to mention it uh, enforced you know, like uniformity. With um, with respect to the type things being typed, so <clears throat> typewriters, mechanical typewriters are quite cool. Uh, if you can ever get your hands on one and start playing with them, but uh, you know they were a little bit finicky and mechanical. And as electronics developed, especially in through the nineteen eighties, it eventually became the case that. Um, we moved from mechanical to electric typewriters. Well, once we were on electric typewriters, it was an extremely short step to then run the electronics of the electro of the electronic typewriter into a computer system, rather than just simply have it directly print on a page. Um, they were popular for a period of time, the electric typewriter. Um, basically, while... Uh, the, the thing that was kind of the death knell of the electric typewriter was the development of decent and reliable word processing software for personal computers. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind about uh, personal computers is that um, when they first came out, they were actually really expensive. Like, uh, the, the personal computers that you saw in the 1980s were like, uh, you would spend several thousand dollars on them. Like, uh, three or four or five thousand dollars on a personal computer that was going to be obsolete in a couple of years anyways. Um, <clears throat> so electric typewriters were for a period of time the um, the cheaper alternative to a full, fully fledged computer. Uh, so, so why am I telling you all of this? When people developed the electric typewriter, there were key codes that basically when you hit a key, you would get a code and that code corresponded to a letter, right? This, this correspondence of numbers to letters was known as ASCII, which I, I always forget what ASCII stands for, but it's American Standard Character Interface something, ASCII. American Standard Code for Information Exchange. American Standard Code for Interfa Information Exchange. So, um, you know, the, um, the iMac Pro can go up to 80K. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's kind of, you know. Yeah, but you got to think of this in, like, 1980s dollars, right? Um... So, you know, the Soviets would have had their own, right? 
And of course, it would uh, it would be mapping to Cyrillic rather than mapping to Romanized characters. Uh, but you know, various competing uh, standards for character encoding existed in the world, uh, you know, back in the 20th century. And ASCII was the one that eventually won out uh, because it was, um, you know, because the technology was better, basically. Um, the American and British um, computer um, uh, computer products were so vastly superior to what was being produced in the Soviet Union that uh, we won on the strength of technolo technological advancement alone. So gradually, ASCII kind of just replaced everything. Um, and certainly after the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, you would uh, the character encodings would have been mostly ASCII. Like, I'm sure in present-day Russia, most of the character encoding is probably Unicode and ASCII. Although, in legacy systems, you probably would still have to deal with the old Soviet encoding. But, uh, anyway. So, how does it work? Well, it's very simple. You've got a number, you've got a, a, a series of numbers, and those numbers correspond to characters. So, when you hit the letter K on your keyboard, and it's in lowercase, the number 108 is transferred and placed into your computer for later retrieval. Um, so, so this is how characters work. So this is why a tuple, uh, or this is why you can think of strings as being tuples of characters. Like, uh, you can get the, you can get actually the ASCII value of any particular, um, uh, any particular character by using Ord 107. Wait, what? Okay. Oh, I'm, I'm reading it wrong. It's like number first, then character. Okay, so K is 107, not 108. Yeah. Uh, so, Ord stands for ordinal. So the ordinal value of K is 107. Um, this is, you know, this is just how the co computer encodes, like, characters. Like, every single, every single message that's popped up in the chat right now is encoded in this manner, right? So this is important to understand about computers, especially when we get into 1xc3 next semester. This stuff comes up quite a bit. Not so much for Python, but it's good to introduce it now. Um, why the numbers 0 to 9 are not in the positions 0 to 9? Well, that's actually very interesting. Ah, yeah, $3,000 in USD in 1980 is almost $10,000 today. And, like, this was for your entry-level computer. Just so you know, like, $10,000 in today's money for, like, not an expensive computer. The mo Like, the most basic computers were in that price range. Um, so, um, let me, let me pull up an ASCII chart. Don't worry about that little bit flash of Haskell. Um, it turns out that I have to teach uh, the three MI three people Haskell as well because there are a bunch of people from the like mathematics and computer science program who never learned Haskell. So by the time they get to uh, my third year course, they don't know it, which is inconvenient for me to say the least. So here, it, yeah, okay. So there's a bunch of these characters that like you would expect perhaps. 0 through 9 to be the characters 0 through 9. But these are actually command codes. So up to, um, like, the first 32 codes are all command codes. Some of them are, re like, reserved. Some of them are still used. Uh, I think delete is in there. Um, bell would make a little bell on your typewriter ding, uh, because in the, like, in the, the really old typewriters would have, like, a a carriage return operation that ended with a bell dinging so that you knew the paper was in position again. <clears throat> like an acknowledge signal. Null character is actually very important for computing. Um, but yeah, you'll see that code 13, CR, that's carriage return, um, which is a typewriter operation. So it's kind of like it's kind of like um, why we still use QWERTY keyboards, even though they're not the most efficient keyboard. You know, um, 
a lot of this stuff exists just for the purpose, like, because it's good enough and changing it would be too much work, right? So character code 13 is carriage return, which is, like, the thing that holds the paper on a typewriter. That's the carriage because it moves back and forth. So carriage return is, like, um, you know, your type, 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 ding! That's, you know... When the carriage returns to its initial position, that's a carriage return operation, which is why on old keyboards, the enter key is actually return. That's a typewriter operation. Um, so, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's for legacy reasons. It's for legacy reasons. Questions? Eight bits. Yeah, um, well, the original ASCII codes were actually only seven bits. Um... Because this was back in the day where each bit cost you money. So they, and, and seven bits was determined to be enough bits. So they actually, um, the original ASCII code was, uh, seven bits. They extended it to support eight bit a ASCII, um, when it be started becoming obvious that typewriters were going the way of the dodo. Uh, so they extended it, they extended it to eight bit ASCII, which bought you an extra, uh, 200 and, no, it bought you an extra 128 characters. So we were then up to 256 characters that we could possibly represent. But of course, you know, there are a lot more than 256 characters used throughout the world for various languages. So eventually, as uh, computers became unified across the planet, and not just like exclusively to English-speaking cultures, um, we extended it to what's now called Unicode. So Unicode um, uses up to, I believe, eight, 16 bits. And currently, well, this is, this is old, so it'll be more than this. But as of these slides being done like a number of years ago, uh, we, were, we were using about 140,000 of the characters. Like all of these emojis that everybody loves, these are all Unicode characters. Ah, that's a delivery. Um... Uh, right? Um, and da, 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 da. So this is why we still have uh, new line character as <laughs> return new line issues. Yes! That's it! That's the reason! Um, oh, no, I'm not saying that Macs are old, specifically. Um... Honey, could you get that? Thank you. Um, so, um, yeah, no, Mac just decided to keep the old term for it. That's why Mac has return and everything else has enter. Um, each bit cost money. Yes. So when you do, like, when you're doing electronic circuits, you know, you could, like, Something like you could save one-eighth of the cost of the circuit by removing one bit. So going from a seven, from an eight-bit to a seven-bit circuit. That would, you would have to put fewer transistors down in the circuitry. So you would have to pay less money for components. So yeah, like you can, you do actually save a lot of money by minimizing the size of electronics. That's, um... Yeah, you know, if you want to get into electronics engineering, I can I can go there, but uh, we should probably continue on with this. Um, when did they add emojis to Unicode? I don't know. I don't know, but you could probably look it up. They probably they probably have an article on the history of emojis somewhere. I can tell you they weren't in typewriters. Uh, they were invented, I believe, like probably in the late '90s. It seems like a late '90s thing to me. But uh, anyway, so. Um, not all fonts have symbols for all characters. You know, when you get that box that, uh, shows up that, um, you know, indicates the character isn't there, it's just because your font doesn't have a, ha doesn't have a rendering for that particular character code. UTF-8 is a way of representing Unicode characters in 8-bit. The first 128 characters of UTF-8 match the first 128 characters of ASCII, Higher Unicode characters take more bytes. So there you go. Generally speaking, most stuff uses Unicode these days, but um, 
Unicode is a superset of ASCII, so um, for the regular characters, it's still useful to look up things in terms of ASCII charts. If you're interested in the Unicode characters, um, there's a good Wikipedia article. Unicode. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. It was 2015 that they started adding emojis. Or maybe not. Nope. That's October 2010. Anyway, I'm getting distracted. Emojis are sometimes different on the application. Do, so do certain numbers represent certain emojis in Unicode, and these apps just interpret them differently. Yes, it's like having a different font. It's actually exactly the same as having a different font, you know? Like, Microsoft has been, like, the Microsoft Office Suite has been using Calibri. There you go. <laughs> uh, uh, they switched to Calibri from Times New Roman a few years ago, and, like, I'm sure for Mac Macintosh, they have their own default font for their text editor. Yeah, it's it's just a font issue. It's not a um it's not that their the emojis are actually different. Although I believe Mac does have some uh emojis like the the if you I've noticed uh with uh my wife's iPhone and my um uh, my Android that sometimes the emojis don't come across completely. I'll get like the black boxes um uh, or the empty boxes instead and um I think that uh I think that Mac and Android might use disjoint character sets with respect to emojis, but, um, you know. Yeah, smartphones, man. Uh, they became popular after 2010 and the rise of smartphones and the, the downfall of human civilization. Um, <laughs> I'm not saying that smart smartphones are the, uh, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, but... Uh, should we memorize this stuff for tests? No, absolutely not. I would never expect you to memorize an ASCII table. So, <clears throat> I wouldn't expect myself to memorize it, so I would not expect you to memorize it. That's kind of my test for, like, is it reasonable for me to ask the students to do this? Would I want to be asked to do this myself? So, um, let's say we have a string. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. If you want to access a particular index of it, you can access it in the same way that you access the elements of a tuple, using numerical indexing. But here's some fun stuff. If you put a colon in there, you can actually get a range of elements. This is known as string slicing. <laughs> um, Yeah. Let's hope you don't know assembly language. I, uh, I know a little bit of assembly language. So, I, so this is, this is how you pick out a range of elements. The way that it works is if you specify two numbers, you'll get, um, there we go. Everything starting at this number and ending at, uh, but not including this number. So we get, in this case, elements 2, 3, 4, 5. 2, 3, 4, 5. So it doesn't include the last number. If you leave it blank, then that just assumes to the end of the string. And if you leave the front blank, that assumes from the beginning of the string. So this is what, li this is called slicing. Where's my pointer? There it is. Um, can slicing be done with lists as well? Yes. So this is this uh, this is actually applicable to anywhere that you can use numerical indexing. We're just introducing it with strings because it's like a slightly easier uh, to visualize. Um, it's not on the slide, but there's also one like there uh, there's another one. Um, 
I'm just going to generate a range here. Range. This is something we're going to see how to do in not too much time. So this is how you would generate numbers 0 through 99, right? So I'm going to save that as L. So if you want to get elements 10 through 60, counting by 4, that's how you do it. If you add a third parameter, that's how much you want to count by. So it's 10, 14, 18, 22, 26, etc., etc. So, why did S... Oh, okay, so S colon colon 6. Why did it not include G? It does, though. I see it right there. Oh, you're, um, you, that's too many colons. So why did this not include six? Because that's the definition. It doesn't include the last number. It goes right up to it and then stops. That's, it's like, um, if you, if you remember from mathematics talking about, um, like ranges of numbers, remember if you use a, um, a square, if you use a square brace, then that, indicates inclusive and if you use a round brace that include that indicates exclusive so yeah how would you slice a string in half if its length was unknown ha 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 i can do that um you do it like for front half or back half i'm gonna do front half there you go Front half, back half. That's how you do it, my friends. You don't have to know the size because you know the size using the length function, which is actually the next one that I was gonna talk about. So the other thing that you can do is you can use count and index to find the occurrences of a substring and the first index of a substring. Why is L at 10, 0, if the index starts at 0? Is it? Oh, because uh, the numbering here also starts at 0. So in this case, these are actually matched up perfectly to the indexes. So there you go. Um, yeah, so you can count the number of occurrences. So if you have something like, hello world, world, world dot count l there are three l's in there and if you want the index of the first l oops, index it's at index two there you go Strings are immutable. Strings can't change individual characters without creating a new string. This means you can use arbitrary uni uh, Unicode characters in string literals directly. That's not what that means. Immutability has nothing to do with using arbitrary Unicode characters. Um, anyway, they're immutable. Um, I, already, I already demonstrated that. So, just like with tuples, you can do concatenation. So, hello plus world, or world, that concatenates the strings. To get a substring, or test to see if a substring is in there, is it like, is a double L in hello world? Yes. Is... your aunt Fanny in, L in Hello World. False. Um, repetition. You can repeat a string X number of times using multiplication. Hello. This also works on tuples, by the way. Hello times three. Hello, hello, hello. You don't have to do all the typing. So if I wanted to make the computer scream, I would do A 
times 1,000,000 plus H. There you go. There, now the computer is screaming. Haha. <laughs> And you can also do a suffix test. So this is actually pretty useful for like practical programming purposes. Let's say you had like a file name, right? Like myfile.txt. If you want to check to see if a file has a certain file extension, you just do ends with .txt. And that's true. However, does it end with a pi? That's false. How about i, p, y, n, b? Nope. There you go. So that's that's a cool way of testing to see if a file is of a particular extension. So there you go. There you go. My your high school teacher got mad at some kid when he figured out he could multiply strings. <laughs> Why? <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> Your high school teacher sounds like a stick in the mud. Nah, you're not you're not programming if you're not having fun. Like the whole thing about programming is like you should be pushing on things and like trying to figure out like where the where the interesting corners are. You know, like, nah, that's just, that's just, that's just quashing the explorative spirit. Now, if it was, if it was like a, uh, a not safe for work string, I could expect, like, I could, uh, I could, uh, I could see that, you know, if it's, you know, some sort of moral puritanism, like, you know, you don't want to, you don't want, don't want to do something like that. Right? Uh, but, uh, you know, just clear that off my screen. This is university. I hope you guys are all used to the existence of swear words by now. Um, <clears throat> so, the, uh, yeah. <laughs> Whenever any, when anyone asked my CS teacher anything, he would get mad because he never knew the answer and used it as a way to, uh, yeah. <laughs> My gosh. <laughs> Time to get the, uh, I'm not even monetized yet and I'm, I'm trying to get myself demonetized. Um, yeah, okay. That looks like that's the end of class, so, um, We'll continue on with this material on Friday. Your high school teacher had a PhD in, in CS. Hmm. Hmm. See... Hmm. So, here, so, yeah, like, this is, this is kind of my, my thing, right, with, um, with programming, like, there's all kinds of, like, kind of fun, stupid stuff you can do with programming, kind of like, like, looking up swear words in the dictionary to level stuff, it's like, I'm I'm the kind of, I'm the kind of teacher that doesn't mind people looking up swear words in the dictionary because at least they're using a dictionary, right? You have to learn how to use a dictionary in order to look up words and swear words in the dictionary. So, <laughs> hopefully, like the 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 trick is are these looking up swear words in the dictionary type skills going to translate to being able to solve actual real problems at some point? And that's what the assignments are for. So, uh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so this this kind of gets into, like, a, a bigger philosophy of mine with respect to computer science education. Um, <clears throat> I kind of view learning to code in the same way that you might learn 
something like jujitsu or karate or judo or one of those cool things that cool people do. Um, when you're first starting off, um, it's they they have this thing. Uh, my my old Tai Chi teacher had said this thing. You know, when like every beginner has like looks very similar because they're all making the same mistakes. Once once you stop making all of the mistakes that everybody makes, uh, there's like this explosion in the different like styles that people will use or the different ways people will go about solving problems, and then. As they solve problems, eventually they'll use more and more efficient problems. So they'll again kind of converge. The skills will begin to converge again, and then you have this prop. You have this interesting property where, like, very, like very, very, like very early beginners and like the masters, almost like they all code in more or less the same way, right? It's, but, like, for me, you have to have the freedom to discover your own style. If you don't have the freedom, like, if you're not thinking about your coding style and developing your own coding style, you'll never reach mastery because you won't have developed the self-criticism skills to, be un to understand when a coding style you're using is less efficient than another one. And that, like, that's what makes you pick up a better coding style, right? Is you... You, the programmer, realizing, oh, wait, I could have done this in four lines instead of 30, you know? <laughs> I could have done this with, with much less effort if I had have just learned this little new construct. And, like, every time you do that, you're, like, you're, like, converging on, like, the single apex point of mastery with coding. Um, but you have to have the freedom to, like... You, you have to have the freedom to diverge in your style from everybody else uh, in order to be able to converge with everybody again uh, at the high level. So, um, yeah, question. When a, com when a question on an assignment says, you can assume, does that mean that we don't have to worry about an input if it's invalid? Yes. So if I say something like, you can assume that M, it, that you can assume that the input n is greater than zero. That means you don't have to write code to handle the case where n is not greater than zero. That's what that means. What sort of research do you do when doing a PhD in computer science? It's pretty broad. Um, it's pretty broad. There are a large number of different things you can do. Um, some of the big areas are um, security and cryptography. That's a big area. A very like it's really hard to get a good uh, cryptography expert, and they're in a huge amount of demand these days. So it's kind of like um, I don't know if this is still true, but it used to be true in the elementary system that if you if you could teach French, then you would you would be guaranteed employment because they were hurting so bad for French teachers. I don't know if this is still true in the uh, in the public elementary system in Ontario, but um, that's because of the like the French immersion programs, um, like doing security is like almost like the golden qualification in in computer science. Like like good security experts, you will never hurt for work. Um, learning to code is cool too. Yeah, I think so. Um, so, you know, that's one area. There's uh, formal methods is another F area. Um, formal methods is, like, broadly speaking, concerned with improving the, reliable, the reliability of programs and programming languages using um, high-level mathematics. Like, um, this is a... Um, this is a course in formal methodologies as applied to programming languages. Um, formal methods is a big area. Um, machine learning, obviously, it's been very popular lately. Um, optimization is a whole thing. 
Um, so sometimes you can use really strange techniques to be able to squeeze more efficiency out of uh, existing algorithms. And if it's a like if it's a broadly used algorithm, like if it's something used in like Google servers and you might manage to using highly advanced mathematics develop some kind of like increased efficiency for it um, that can be highly highly applicable in the world um, algorithms research is I, I would consider it to be like one of the most difficult things but that's you know just one of my personal biases um, <clears throat> do you have to be good at math to be a good cryptographer you have to be good at math to do anything with computers but yeah um, like at each one of the disciplines each one of the subdisciplines I just illustrated you have to be a math whiz kid like there's that uh, in order to do a in order to do graduate work in computers you should be um, you should be a very good math student very good math student um, uh, would a math minor help um, Depends what type of math. Like, calculus won't be... Like, integral and differential calculus won't be particularly helpful. Like, if you're studying math that's relevant, that's more important. Study, like, discrete math. Like, uh, like this kind of stuff. This is Naive Set Theory by Paul Halmus. It's uh, uh, one of the um, classic texts on set theory. I would recommend it. Um... Um, for the assignment, we do not have to worry about the user inputting an invalid input, right? For example, the minutes of program, we don't have to worry about the, where the user might pass an A in. That's correct, yeah. Um, you don't have to worry about invalid input just yet. Uh, we'll eventually get there, but yeah, you may assume uh, for the time being that the input is valid. Yes. What has linear algebra to do in comp sci? Well, um... Linear algebra is actually highly, highly applicable in, in computer science. Um, think about video games, right? When you're rendering a 3D environment, what are you doing? Linear algebra, matrix multiplications, like all of that type of math, that's like, yeah, that's li like linear algebra is highly applicable, highly applicable. Um, I said I'd talk about the Cambrian Explosion. I said I'd talk about it if somebody asked about it, and you're now asking about it at, like, uh, well, you probably asked earlier than this, but it's now, like, 10.30, so I should I should get off the air. But, uh, <clears throat> yeah. Ask me on Friday about the Cambrian Explosion, and I'll talk to you about the Cambrian Explosion. Um, yes. Matrices, yes. Um... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ma matrices are like matrices are a decent model for how you do um, like lists. Actually, like if you have a, a two-dimensional list, which is totally a thing. Boom, matrix. Computer vision relies heavily on math ma on matrices as well. Yeah, yeah. Computer computer vision is, yeah, because you know what is a picture? It's a matrix, right? Are you going to learn how to code the row reduction algorithm? Um, Row reduction algorithm on test underline star by it. Thank you for the test question idea. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> Can I live code Minesweeper using matrices? Um, 
that's a little bit outside of um, the scope for this course, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> to do mines, like, I could, I could, like, do something like that in, like, a game engine like Unity, but not in Python. And we're learning Python. Uh, I don't know how to use, like, like, Python's got libraries for it, but I don't know how to use them. Uh, just wanted to ask, do you have to bring laptops to class uh, in person when they begin? Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I would recommend uh, for in-person classes getting a good laptop, to be honest with you. Um, even like the thing the thing that's nice about laptop like laptops are like perfectly designed for the university experience because it's like you're between classes you've got an hour you can just flip open the thing sit in the hallway and like do part of an assignment uh very very useful <laughs> um <laughs> Oh, uh, people didn't like the idea of doing uh, doing matrix operations on on the test, eh? <laughs> yeah. All right. See you, folks. See you on Friday, um, where we'll do mo more fun math and stuff. Take her easy. <laughs>